we back at the Hillbrow Hospital to look at some more statistics. On our last visit to the hospital, the matron told us that the children's ward needs more beds. We used her records to make a five number summary, a box and a whisker plot to support the hospital's request for more beds. We found that 75% of the time, the children's ward needed 39 beds. Ah, here comes the matron. I found your box and whisker plot really, really helpful. I'm hoping it's going to give us a better plan for our nurses in the children's ward to see how many we need at different times of the year. Great. I hope it helps you get the extra beds that you need. Today we want to do some more data handling using your hospital records. Can you tell me about some of the illnesses that children come to you with? The most common problem is diarrhea um, or gastric flu. The children become dehydrated and if they're not treated quickly, they can lose consciousness or even die. That sounds terrible. Surely this is something that can be prevented? Well, it's often um, a result of children living in communities where they don't have easy access to water and sanitation. Um, if the local council can um, you know, improve the water supply and sanitation systems, I'm sure that will go a long way in dealing with the problem. Perhaps we could use our data handling to show the city council just how serious this is. Any help will be most welcome. I'll send the records through to you. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to compare data using box and whisker plots, decide on an appropriate way to represent data graphically, read and interpret the cumulative frequency graph, and identify how graphs can be used to support a point of view. I've found some interesting research from the Health Systems Trust about diarrhea in South Africa. It seems that high numbers of children under the age of five are being admitted to hospitals with diarrhea. Children living in poorer rural areas are more often ill than those in other places. A lack of clean water has been identified as a major factor contributing to a high number of children suffering with diarrhea. This compound bar graph represents the number of cases of diarrhea in children under the age of five. It compares the number of cases for 2002 with the number of cases for 2004. For example, in the Eastern Cape, 126 out of every 1,000 children under the age of 5 were admitted to hospital with diarrhea in 2002. That's a lot of children. If we work this out as a percentage, 126 out of 1,000 is 12,6 out of 100. So it is 12,6%. In 2004, this was reduced to 112 cases per 1,000 children. That's 11,2%. What observations can you make about this graph? First, look at the two bars for each province. What comparisons can you make between the different provinces? Did you see that the highest incident of diarrhea was in KwaZulu Natal in 2002? We could expect this because they've got a very big rural poor population. But the good thing is that between 2002 and 2004, the numbers went down. So let's hope that this decrease has continued since then. Did you also notice that the decrease in 2004 does not apply to all provinces? In the Free State, Gauteng, and the Northern Cape, the incidence of diarrhea has increased between 2002 and 2004. So, these provinces would have to look at why their problem has increased and not decreased. Also, the numbers for Gauteng are interesting. In 2002, they reported a zero incidence of diarrhea in children under five. This could mean that there was the odd case, but not enough to report. However, in 2004, Gauteng did report an increase of 8 children per thousand. Remember that graphs of statistics can help us to notice patterns or trends in the data, but we still need to be careful about how we interpret those statistics. Although Gauteng's numbers are lower than other provinces' numbers, the increase from 2002 to 2004 is worrying. Now let's have another look at the graph. Does it give us a picture, a visual representation of what is happening in South Africa as a whole? Can we tell from these graphs whether the incidence of diarrhea in children under the age of five has decreased from 2002 to 2004? Unfortunately, the bar graph doesn't show this overview, but a box and a whisker plot make these comparisons well. 
let's set up a box and a whisker plot of the data of each year and then compare them to each other. We can start by putting the data for each year into order and find the five number summary for it. For 2002, the minimum value is zero and the maximum value is 264. The median is 126, the lower quartile is 107, and the upper quartile is 192. Then for 2004, the minimum value is 8, and the maximum value is 244. The medium is 112, and the lower quartile is 100, and the upper quartile is 185. Remember, these five numbers provide us with a summary or an overview of the data. Now let's have a look at each set of the data if we represent it in a box and a whisker plot. Do you see that they represent a summary of the data, but they don't tell us which number belongs to which province? They give us an overview of statistics for the whole country, but the separate values for each province are hidden. What comparisons can you make between the whole set of the data for 2002 and the whole set of data for 2004? Look at the box part of the graph first. The whole box for 2004 lies more to the left than the box for 2002. That shows us that the middle half of the data for 2004 is less than the middle half for 2002. That's good news. It shows that overall, there were fewer children admitted to hospital with diarrhea in 2004. But do the maximum and minimum values of these statistics give us useful information? We could say that the maximum value has dropped from 264 cases in 2002 to 244 cases in 2004. But that doesn't tell us what happened to the rest of the data. We can see that the spread of the data or the range for 2002 is slightly bigger than the spread or range for 2004. Let's see if the interquartile range can help us more. Remember that this is the range from the lower quartile to the upper quartile. So it tells us what is happening in the middle half of the data. The interquartile range for the data for 2002 spreads from 107 to 202. That's a spread of 96. The middle 50% of the data shows that between 107 children and 202 children per province were admitted to the hospital with diarrhea. The interquartile range for 2004 spreads from 100 to 185. That's a spread of 86. So the difference between the data values is less than for 2002. Here's something else to think about. Would you say that the data is skewed or symmetric? Do you remember how to check this? If the median lies in the middle of the box and the whiskers on each side are equal, then we have symmetric data. Both our box and the whisker plots are skewed. The box is much bigger on the right of the medium than on the left. This means that they are both skewed to the right or positively skewed. So although the medium is in the middle of the data, the data is more spread out to the right. We can say that 50% of the provinces had fewer than 126 cases of diarrhea in 2002 and 50% of the provinces had less than 112 cases in 2004. The median for 2002 is also a slightly higher value than the median for 2004. So, this suggests that the number of children with diarrhea has been reduced. As we saw earlier, some information is hidden by this graph. It doesn't give us information for each province. So, let's take our findings to the matron. Even if the incidence of diarrhea in her hospital is increasing, we can reassure her that overall, the incidence in South Africa is decreasing. I think I need to discuss your graphs with my staff. I can show them that the figures have dropped in other areas of South Africa. Also, local town council, you know, they need to see this, to be reminded of, of how important it is to provide easy access to water and sanitation. And perhaps our people in the communities, they need to know the importance of hygiene um, in our society. Well, let's see if we can find out just how many households in this community do have access to clean water. I asked the town council for these records and they gave me statistics dating back from 1995. Here are two different graphs representing the data. Although they look so different, they represent the same information. This graph is a frequency polygon. 
It shows how many households have had piped water installed in their house each year. The years from 1995 to 2005 are shown on the x-axis and the number of installations is shown on the y-axis. Remember, the frequency is always on the y-axis. So, in 1995, 10 new households had water pipes installed for them. But, in 2005, 90 households had water pipes installed. In 2004, they only installed water pipes in 4 households. But you can see that more were installed in 2005 than in the previous years. Perhaps the town council decided to prioritize water that year. Unfortunately, we can't tell from that graph how the community is doing. We assume that all these new installations have given more households access to clean water. This second graph is better at showing us how the installations have affected the community. It shows us that in 1995, 211 households had piped water. Over 10 years, this number increased until it reached 536 households in 2005. 536! That's more than double the number of households that had piped water in 1995. That's good news for the community. This graph is called an O-drive or cumulative frequency graph. The word cumulative means to gradually build up. And that's what the graph does. It gradually builds up to the total frequency of what we're measuring. And each plotted value is the total of the frequency up to that point. It gives us the total number of new installations and the ones installed in previous years. In other words, the total is added to every year. The frequency shown in 1996 is the total up to 1995 plus the new installations for 1996. The frequency for 2005 is a total of all the households with water up to that point. That's why the graph keeps increasing from year to year. The steepness of the slope of the graph between 2004 and 2005 shows that there is a big increase in installations of piped water in 2005. The graph is also steep between 1998, 1999 and 2000. So, in those years, more water pipes were installed. The graph is almost flat between 2003 and 2004. That's because very few pipes were installed. So can you describe the general trend of this graph? I would say it shows a significant increase in the number of households with piped water. We can't really tell more than that from the graph. For example, we can't predict how steep or flat the slope of the line will be for the coming years. So, we found that a cumulative frequency graph gives us a better sense of the total of our data than a frequency polygon. Is there any more data needed for this community that we haven't shown in the graph? This graph doesn't give us the total population or the total number of households in the community. So, we don't know how many households still don't have piped water. What would help us here is to know what percentage 536 is out of the total number of households. So, here's a third graph on the data for piped water in the community. This time, it shows what percentage of households have piped water each year. In 1995, only 19% of the community had piped water. This increased over the years so that by 2005, it had risen to 33%. This is a significant increase. The cumulative frequency graph showed that the numbers had more than doubled, but the bar graph of the percentages showed a smaller increase. Why do you think there's a difference? The difference lies in the total population of the community. The population hasn't stayed constant throughout the 10 years. In fact, the number of households increased from 1,110 in 1995 to 1,621 in 2005. So, we've put this increase into another cumulative frequency graph. Can you see that the slope of the graph is steeper in the earlier years and flatter in the later years? The trend of this graph suggests that, although the total number of households in the community is increasing, the rate of increasing has slowed down. So what can we conclude from this graph? Firstly, we know that the number of households with piped water has increased significantly. However, when we see this as a percentage, the increase is affected by the fact that the total number of households in the community is also increasing. 
So, 536 households with piped water is still only 33% of what is needed in the community. As in any data handling situation, you need to understand that people can use these different graphs to support their own argument about a situation. The cumulative frequency graph showing the number of installations seems to present a more positive picture of the situation than the bar graph showing the percentage of the total number of households. If you're managing a team responsible for installing piped water, you might decide the first frequency polygon shows how hard your team has worked. You might not be so interested in the totals in the community. None of these graphs that represent the data are strictly wrong. It's just that each one has a different purpose. Now let's take another look at what we've learned from this lesson. When you want to get an overview of the distribution of data over time, in order to compare it with another set of data, it can be useful to use two box and whisker plots. The interquartile range gives us a summary of the spread of the middle half of the data. This is often more useful to us than the range of the data. Symmetrical data is shown when the box or the median are more or less central. If the data is skewed right, we say it's positively skewed. If the data is skewed left, we say it is negatively skewed. A cumulative frequency graph can be used to show an accumulation of data over time. It can also be used to predict a trend in the data going into the future. Graphs can be used to support a point of view. Now, it's time for your task. Have you realized that on some boxes of cigarettes, there's a warning that warns you on smoking while pregnant? We know that it's likely for pregnant women who smoke to have smaller babies than women who don't. Use these five number summaries to draw and compare box and whisker plots. Birth weights of babies born to mothers who smoke. Range, 1,560 grams to 3,410 grams. Lower quartile, 2,220 grams, median, 2,360 grams, upper quartile, 2,510 grams. Birth weights of babies born to mothers who don't smoke, range 2,450 grams to 4,550 grams, lower quartile, 3,010 grams, median, 3,280 grams, upper quartile, 3,880 grams. Are these data sets symmetrical or skewed? And comment on the difference between the data sets. We'll be back with more statistics next time, so don't forget to join us.